Composting is a very important and transformative process in organic and regenerative farming. At any new site, it's important to designate a zone for your composting. Here, I have designated a zone that is in my zone one close to my house. I can literally throw food scraps and waste into these bins from my front porch. They are also easily accessible with a wheelbarrow where I can drop off material or pick up compost when it's finished. These bays were designed and built from treated lumber, four x four posts that I cemented in, along with a 5 8 exterior plywood shell. The C to N ratio or carbon to nitrogen ratio is an important ratio in composting. Typically it's 25 to 30 parts carbon to one part nitrogen. Some carbon materials would include, but it's not limited to wood chips, leaves, cardboard, paper, sawdust, animal bedding, straw, twigs, needles, peat moss, cocoa core. After studying with the Soil Food Web School, the nitrogen is definitely best described in two categories. Green materials such as weeds, kitchen waste, grass clippings, tree trimmings, coffee grounds, and also the high nitro party foods, so to speak. Those would be things like manure, fish byproducts, blood meal, things that are really going to get the pile fired up quickly. And when it comes to manure, you really want a trusted source. What were those animals eating? I will only source manure from open pasture fed livestock and cattle that were grazing and eating organic grasses and grains. So here's a third category of additions and inoculants that we can add into our compost piles if we choose to. None of these are mandatory by any means. They're just extras that we can add in. We can customize and tailor and have some fun with our piles, put our unique signature behind our pile. And if you have any experience culturing or making any of these inputs or substrates, then why not add them to the compost and recycle them back in? Or simply if you have access to any of these, they can be great additions to further diversify the microbiology. Adding samples of previously finished compost is a nice way to inoculate our piles with some of those microbial matrixes, those that would help to diversify our microbiome in the soil food web. The same way we would use a sourdough starter from a previous batch to start our new batch. IMO 3 and 4 is another great addition. This is a Korean natural farming technique for culturing indigenous microorganisms on a substrate, usually of mill run. We can also use the spent substrates of potatoes that we mashed up from Jadam method using Jadam microbial solution, great addition to a compost pile. Bokashi is another method of culturing beneficial microorganisms. Biochar is an amazing addition to a compost pile to charge the biochar, or we can add charged biochar to our pile as an inoculant. I love biochar because it's a universal inoculum, right? Because you can use it in permaculture, Korean natural farming and Jadam, and also biodynamics recognizes the value of biochar, which adds structure and long-term housing for beneficial microorganisms. If you know a mushroom cultivator that is not recycling their substrate after use, you can be the missing link to recycle that material back into viable humus through the composting process while adding another culture of fungi. Lactic acid bacteria serum or the curds can be added to the compost as well. And labs has a unique way of regulating the microbial world. They definitely help to keep pathogens in check for sure. And they're also really great at breaking down organic matter. However, just keep in mind, we're not trying to create a monoculture of any one microorganism. We do want that diversity. So we don't wanna to add too much of any culture that is going to completely take over and devastate a polyculture. Biodynamic inoculants are another excellent addition to a compost pile to really get that diversity of microorganisms really kick-started. BSG or Brewer Spent Grain is another great byproduct of the brewing industry. That is the spent grains used in brewing malts that 
have some residual sugars as well as yeast and bacteria like lactic acid bacteria and can be a fine addition to your compost pile. So ask your local brewery, what are they doing with their spent malts? You may be doing them a big favor by picking some of that up. Let's go source some materials and we'll get composting. It is late January here at Tecolote Forest Farm. We're between successions. Spring is on the horizon and I'm doing some weeding to the garden to clear some space, plant some new cover crops, nitrogen fixtures, as well as an array of pollinator flowers for the bees and a great time to collect all this biomass for our thermophilic composting bays. This will be a good mass of nitrogen material that we can balance with some carbon material. Our first bay here, we're using to store some of the woody carbon material, the wood chips, to use when we have green material coming in that we can find a balance with the two. The other three bays can be used for the different stages of composting, mixing and turning to each of the next bays during that process of composting. The other nitrogen source I'm adding here is food scraps from the kitchen. Things like coffee grounds, banana peels, orange rinds, any leftovers, fruit that has gone past its prime or soured. Low tide. Here at the bay, we have some seaweed that's washed in. So I'm going to collect some kelp for the compost. You can see behind me here. It's not a ton, but there's enough. So fortunately, I live pretty close to here. And I can come down a low tide and just check to see what's up or what's down. And here we have a array of different seaweeds here. A nice mix. Make some fine compost. Seaweed and kelp is not an on-site resource, I'll admit but it is within a mile from my farm and kelp and seaweed is an amazing resource if you have access to the ocean it's really just a great material to compost with a nitrogen source high in trace elements as well so my rule of thumb for materials for the compost is to source on site first secondly source from your local areas where you're not disturbing any wild habitat All right, we're back here at Tecolote Food Forest in front of the composting bays. And we have our seaweed score right here. So we're gonna add this nitrogen rich material to the compost and fire this up. So now we'll just turn in the seaweed into the compost pile and try to get a homogenous mix. Did you know organic stickers are not organic? Note to self. Fun fact. I'm digging down into the original lasagna cardboard layers and they've been nicely inoculated with fungus. You can see the mycelium spreading across and I'll just rip it up into smaller pieces. So the next element we need here is water to really activate the compost pile. We want that moisture level to be about 50% in our pile. So I'm really soaking it down, especially in an arid dry climate like Southern California. It's really important to activate and really soak it down initially. If I was in a wetter climate like the Pacific Northwest, I would definitely use less water. But again, here in a dry climate, I'm really going to soak this down. After our first turn, our pile is starting to heat up, up above 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Ideally, we're looking to raise the pile up to a temperature of 140 to 160 degrees Fahrenheit for a couple of days at least. 
Holding these temperatures will help the pasteurization of compost and pasteurization does not mean sterilization. We want that healthy soil food web. The thermal sensitive pathogens are what we're trying to kill off along with fly larvae and rendering the weed seeds inert. Composting is really all about decomposing organic matter into a humus, but the real value in the compost that we are creating, that we're transforming and transmuting, is really the value of the microorganisms that we're culturing, that soil food web of bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and nematodes, attracting earthworms as well to the mix and establishing this whole soil food web that is so critical to the fertility of soil. The true foundation of a healthy ecosystem, which inevitably will attract higher orders of macro organisms and bring the whole ecosystem together in harmony. We got up to temperatures of 155 and now I'm pulling out all the biomass, cardboard, everything in the mix. I'm going to string it out in a line and then strategically place it back so that the bottom goes on top, the top goes on bottom, and we're sure to get a thorough mix throughout the pile. It's been about three weeks since we first started the pile, so we're moving right along, starting to see some really dark humic acids forming in the pile, which is a sign of fungus in the compost. It's a good sign. And we're a few weeks out from finishing this compost. It's always good to take a little break, smell the roses, and check out the produce. Soon we'll be applying our compost to feed the peppers, tomatoes, garlic, everything else we've planted. Springtime is just around the corner. Just over a month has elapsed since we first started our compost. We're ready to sift off some of the finished compost. We do have some pieces of cardboard and some branches that is not finished. We can throw those into the bin that is still finishing and use this compost because we have rains right around the corner and it's an opportune time to feed our orchard here at the end of January, beginning of February. I certainly could have been more discerning with the materials that I was using and the timing along with some of the branches that I added in and that would have made it easier to completely finish the compost all at once. But in this case, given the circumstances, I'm going to make a sifter from this board and some simple chicken wire that is a one inch diameter chicken wire. So here I'm marking the corners so that I can just cut out a nice rectangle of this board. I'll have edges along the outer sides that I can staple my chicken wire to and create a mesh screen in the middle that will create a nice sifter for the compost. So now that we have our window carved out, we can secure the chicken wire onto the edges by just stapling it on. So now our sifter is ready to use. We'll just prop it up on a sawhorse and do a little improvising here with some buckets. I'm putting down a tarp to catch all of the compost below the sifter. That way I can easily collect it and put it into my bucket or my wheelbarrow for application. So now we'll just prop up the sifter on our two ends here. We have a sawhorse and a couple of buckets should suffice just fine. And it's time to do some sifting. So I'm just going to scoop out some scoops with the fork and we'll get to sifting all the big debris. Some of the stuff that needs to be further composted will be left on top. For the larger debris that's left over, we'll toss that into the second bin that is still finishing composting. Or the woody materials will make a great mulch.
So all the finely sifted compost is settled on the bottom. We have some beautiful black gold that's been produced from materials that were all sourced on site or within a mile from the farm. By now you're probably starting to see that thermophilic composting is quite a bit of work to make this, but I find it very rewarding, very fulfilling, and even though I use other Jadam techniques, other composting styles and methods, and a passive compost that I used to do in the past where you don't have to turn as frequently, it's a lot less hands-on. I still love thermophilic composting and will still be doing thermophilic composting with these bays. Our biologically active cocoa colored compost is complete and ready for application. So over in the wheelbarrow, you can see what was sifted out on top. We have some seaweed that didn't finish breaking down, some hot and taut stems, some twigs. We have some cardboard that didn't get finished processing and some larger sticks. So all of that will go back into the secondary compost that is not finished yet. Approximately 40 days after we started our compost, we are ready for application down in the food forest. And the avocados are going to get some top dressing today, right before the rains tomorrow. Here I'm top dressing around the avocados, the drip zone where the feeder roots extend out to, which will slow release and steadily feed the topsoil microorganisms and our trees for months to come. Late January and early February is an opportune time to top dress the compost in the orchard because the trees are just coming out of state of dormancy. So they're waking up and this will be their breakfast for the season ahead. The only other thing I'm going to add here is a two to three inch layer of Ramio wood chips to mulch in over this compost and that'll help to protect the topsoil here, retain moisture and protect the living soil that we've been building over the last year. Watch for the next video that I drop that includes this composting in a larger system of chop and drop, weed and feed, inoculating, basically this in between time during the seasons, between the successions of our summer crop and our winter crop, and culturing indigenous microorganisms to feed the soil food web. So look for this video coming out very soon on a more in-depth video of everything happening here for the past few months during the winter time. If you're digging the content, please harvest the like button and subscribe pay it forward and please help the algorithms get moving so that we can get this information out to others and share the knowledge, share the love about regenerative farming and tapping back into nature farming, which is natural farming. Mm-hmm.